ערב טוב, מסע אל חיר, good evening and welcome. I'm excited and full of gratitude to open our webinar, Coping with Trauma in Violent Reality. My name is Ruhama Weiss and I'm a professor of spiritual care and Talmud at Hebrew Union College. I'm the director of the Blaustein Center for Spiritual Care and Counseling, which was established around 20 years ago. The Blaustein Center initiated this webinar and it initiates a variety of, activi of activities of spiritual care in times of war, as well as in times of peace. This is an opportunity to tell you that if you want to receive details about our other events, please contact us by email. Our email address will be displayed in the chat several times. I thank the management and the staff of Hebrew Union College for the efforts made, huge efforts, to organize this important and necessary event, an event that offers an in-depth study of the sufferings, the loss, and the costs of war, as well as methods and ways to heal and maintain hope and humanity. I want to thank in particular Noar Zahav, Doron Levin, Michael Bretman, and Salim Yagmo. The large number of participants in this webinar indicates the personal, communal, and professional need for a spiritual, psychological, and psychological dialogue between trauma and about trauma and healing. Two very important guests volunteered to help us all in this difficult time. They will present lectures and answer questions from the audience via chat. I would like to thank the, the psychiatrist, Professor Judith Lewis Herman, from the bottom of my heart. Professor Herman, your book, Trauma and Recovery, became a guidebook for life to me and to many of us. Professor Herman's book brought about a huge change in the attitude toward victims of sexual violence in the therapeutic and general community in Israel. I would like to thank Professor Rabbi Jonathan John Davidson. I'm proud to say that Professor Davidson studied at Hebrew Union College years ago. He is a professor of psychiatry at Mayo Clinic School of Medicine in Rochester, Minnesota. Professor Davidson is a peace activist and he visited in Israel and is his Israeli and Palestinian friends here just two weeks ago. He offered us all his support. There are not enough words, John, to say how much I'm grateful for your visit, your help, and your long-term friendship. My partner in leading this evening is the clinical psychologist, Dr. Ayelet Cohen-Vider, a researcher, a practitioner, and one of the most important activists in Israel. Dr. Cohen Vido teaches psychology at Hebrew Union College, and ever since the outbreak of the war, she is constantly busy trying to heal broken hearts. Thank you, Dr. Cohen Vido, for being with us for so many years and for finding the time to be with us on this important evening. Professor Andrew Rayfield, the president of HS Hebrew Union College will open, will open this ev evening with few remarks. Professor Rayfield. Thank you, Professor uh, Weiss. Uh, Ruhama, thank you for your leadership and for your, um, uh, for your guidance and for uh, launching this at this moment. Uh, can, you, can you all see me just as a technical matter? I don't, uh, I'm not seeing the video. Great, terrific. Um, so, folks, thank you for joining us today at this very important webinar. Uh, I'm the president of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. We've been around since 1875. We're in the business of forming leaders who can apply Jewish wisdom to the most pressing moral, spiritual, and communal challenges of our day. 
This includes rabbis and cantors, educators, and nonprofit leaders, recognizing that there are multiple ways to lead and to lead well. This idea of multiple excellences causes us to train people in everything from organizational skills to speaking, to learning, to teaching, and of course, pastoral care. October 7th and the events that we are now dealing with in Israel, the war and its aftermath, will stand among the most traumatic events in the history of our people. And given that history, that's saying quite a bit. Through the work of our Blaustein Center, HUC is realizing that very vision I just described of creating leaders to apply the wisdom of our tradition to this harrowing moment, to help people live lives of dignity, meaning, and purpose, even at a time of great distress. And this session on coping with trauma in a violent reality is a perfect example of that work, drawing deep from our well of tradition and figuring out ways to help people cope and navigate at a very difficult time. So with that, I want to thank you again for being here. I will not be able to stay, but I did want to just give the endorsement and celebrate this work with my gratitude. Ruhama, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm very proud to introduce Radir Hani, a leader and activist for coexistence and peace. She is a brave leader who expresses compassionate and clear voice even and mostly in difficult times. Kadir, I thank you for your courage and honesty. I admire you. You're such a great person and important leader for all of us. Thank you, Kadir. אז ערב טוב לכולם, אני ככה מתרגשת מאוד מהאחריות לשאת הערב את דברי הפתיחה. שמי רדיר הרני. Just a sec, רק רגע, I forgot to say that Gadir's translation will be translated to English on chat, you can see her word on chat. Sorry Gadir. The stage is yours. אז שמי רדיר האני ואני תושבת עכו, אני פעילה למען שלום וחיים משותפים במסגרת יוזמות וארגונים שונים. אינני מומחית לטראומה, ואני מחכה ככה להקשיב למומחיות ולמומחים שידברו בהמשך הערב, אבל רציתי לפתוח את הערב בכמה מילים שאני מאמינה שמתחברים מאוד לנושא הכנס הזה. ככה ניסיתי לחשוב ב- בימים האחרונים מה המילה בעברית שהיא ההפך מטראומה. חשבתי שאולי המילה המדויקת היא החלמה, אבל חשבתי שעבורי, ברמה האישית, המילה תקווה היא מסמלת את ההפך מטראומה. ואני רוצה להסביר למה אני, למה אני מתכוונת. הטראומה שכולנו חווינו בשביל אוקטובר או בימים לאחר מכן, ובעצם עד היום, לעולם לא תשכח. במעגל הראשון של הטראומה, כמובן הנפגעים או בני המשפחות שלהם, במעגל השני כולנו, גם אלו שלא היו בקו האש, כולנו מכירים, כולנו חברים וחברות, קרובי משפחה, וגם למי שאין היכרות אישית קרובה, הרגשות דומים. באופן אישי, איבדתי חברות וחברים קרובים במתקפת הטרור הזו. על הקשר המיוחד שהיה לי עם ויביאן סילבר, כתבתי ודיברתי הרבה. הכאב על הירצחה של חברה קרובה, שותפה ומודל לחיקוי הוא עצום. ויביאן הייתה עבור רבים מאיתנו אה, האור שבראש המחנה. הידיעה שנרצחה באכזריות כזו לא נותנת לי מנוחה, ואני מנסה להתנחם בכך שבמותה הפכה ויביאן לסמל לאמונה בשלום. גם אם המציאות כרגע הכי רחוקה מחזון השלום. כאזרחית המדינה וכערבייה, הטראומה היא לא רק אישית, אלא גם לאומית וגם דתית. העם שלי, העם הפלסטיני, הוכה בתדהמה. מעשי הזוועה שנעשו, כביכול בשם מאבק בכיבוש, המיתו בושה וחרפה גדולה על כולנו. הידיעה שבני עמי יחוללו זוועות כאלה לא עוזבת אותי, במיוחד בלילה, בשינה, בחלומות. המחשבה שהסכסוך הישראלי-פלסטיני הגיע לממדי אכזריות שכזו היא בלתי נסבלת. כאישה מוסלמית הרואה בדרך האסלאם מקור הרש... ההשראה של חיי, הידיעה שוב שכביכול בשם הדת שלי בוצעו הזוועות הללו קשה מנשוא. 
דרך האסלאם איננה מקור סמכות לטרור אכזרי, טרור מיני או כל סוג אחר של טרור. במובנים רבים, הטראומה שאני חשה בתקופה החשוכה הזו פוגשת את המורכבות הזהותית שלנו, אזרחיה הערבים של המדינה. אז כיצד יכולה, באמת כיצד יכולה לצמוח תקווה בשדות הדם והטראומה? במובנים רבים, אני בכנות לא יודעת. לא בטוחה בכלל שיש זרעים כאלה, אבל אני מתבוננת סביב ורואה שאין לנו ברירה. התקווה היא הברירה היחידה שנותנת לנו מול כל מעגל השנאה ההולך ומתרחב. זו, בעצם התקווה היא זו שנתרה לנו. התקווה היא האפשרות היחידה לחיים במציאות הקשה בארץ הקודש. התקווה איננה זכות, אלא חובה. מתוך הכאב העצום, בכל יום אנו צריכים לקום ולבחור בהחלמה, בנחמה, בהכלה ובתקווה. אישה מוסלמית, אני מאמינה שהמציאות מציבה בפנינו מכשולים וקשיים שמחייבים אותנו לבחור בין בחירות קשות. את הטראומה לא נוכל למחוק, אך בצומת הדרמטית של הימים האלה, כולנו, כולנו חייבים לבחור בחיים, בצמיחה, בידידות, במילה הטובה, באוזן הקשבת ובכתף התומכת. שוב אני רוצה להודות על ההזדמנות שנתתם לי הערב, ואני מאחלת לכולנו ימים של שלום ותקווה. שוכרן. Thank you, thank you so much, תודה רבה, גדיר, for your words, words of hope, seeds of hope, and thank you for the inspiration. Many, many, many thanks for you for being with us. Thanks to our guests from United States, Professor Judy Thurman and Professor John Davidson. Trauma creates splits in the time dimension, in the mind, and in the sense of sequence. Your presence here and now with us creates an integration and expands our hearts and souls. Thank you, Professor Ruhama Weiss, for creating this event, this space for us to be together with our different languages, different cultures, countries, and lands, but with the same shared hope for finding ways to recovery and repair. Professor Weiss is very modest. In addition to her roles in the college, she is also a poet, writer, publicist, artist, and one of the busiest activ activists in Israel in the field of feminism, sexual abuse, coexistence, and peace. Professor Herman, I was introduced to your book when I was a young psychology intern almost 30 years ago. I was then working in an organization that employed 5,000 religious girls during the national service, often from treatments that initially seemed to us, sorry, that initially seemed to us very simple and a, sorry, 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 a picture emerged of a great deal of sexual abuse within the Orthodox community. Your book, Trauma and Recovery, was a godsend for me. It helped me to understand the connection between what happens in the treatment room and what happens in the social and public arena. Your book was for me like a beam of light as I walked through a minefield in the dark. On the basis of your book, with its clear and profound explanations, we launched an extensive project 
that integrate psychotherapy with social and legal and public activity in the field of sexual trauma, especially within the religious and orthodox community. Two months ago, a few days before October 7, I met two young Orthodox sisters in my clinic. I think that they are here with us. These two young women are highly intelligent, highly educated professional women. They told me about very severe sexual abuse that they had suffered at the hands of their grandfather, father, uncles, and neighbors. The abuse was characterized by religious rituals and was also carried out by the abusers in a group. The abusers are highly educated also, in many cases holding leading positions in various professions and in the religious society. Unthinkable things, unperceived things, the young women described to me their experience when they read your book, Trauma and Recovery. They say that with every sentence they read, they say to themselves and to each other, to each other, how does she know? How does she know? Your book gave them redemption from terrible loneliness and feelings of isolation and gave them the strength to tell their story. In your book, you connected different but very similar worlds, situations, the Holocaust wars and sexual trauma. And now, since October 7, we have experienced these three forms of trauma combined the unbearable trauma of terrorism and war, the horrendous kidnapping of babies, children, and their parents from their beds, young adults from a music festival, unspeakable sexual abuse, and overwhelming feelings of persecution and antisemitism that evoke memories of the Holocaust in many of us. A year ago, you published a new book, Truth and Repair, and we hope that we will be able to meet and to talk about the place of justice within the recovery process. In the Jewish world, there is a revered place for the written Torah next to the oral Torah. This evening, we are here in honor of the oral Torah. It is our privilege to hear from you, your wisdom, your insights, and ideas about crisis responses to trauma. You are all invited to ask questions right via the chat during the lecture. Questions can be asked in Hebrew, English, or Arabic. The number of questions answered will depend on time limitation. Professor Judith Ehrman, please. You have to, you are un, you are mute. You have to unmute, yeah. Yes, yes, thanks. Yes, Sorry. Right. Okay, uh, so anyway, I, I do want to thank you for uh, having me join you. It's a privilege, it's an honor, and it, it's good for me because from far away I feel very helpless, and uh, it's, it's a gift to me to be able to contribute something, um, and then I don't feel so helpless. And and that's really the, the the being able to do something is part of what I want to talk about um, in terms of the 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 beginning of a recovery, even in the period of crisis. And the other thing I want to talk about is 
overcoming isolation and shame. Uh, the themes that, that you have mentioned already. Um, uh, and, and we have a lot of good data now that, that show that in the aftermath of trauma, the, um, the two things, there, there are three things actually that predict good recoveries. One is being able to take some action to try to establish safety. Um, and safety is obviously a relative term. Uh, uh, having a safety plan might just mean having a shelter with food stored there, you know, and, and knowing when to go into a bunker. Um, but um, uh, when we see battered women in the emergency room, for example, besides treating her physical injuries, we start right away on a safety plan. Uh, what can you do to protect yourself? If you aren't gonna, if you aren't ready to leave your home, can you have a go bag? Can you have, talk to a friend who could take you in in an emergency? Um, I mean, it, the plan is individualized, but having a plan is a beginning of an antidote to helplessness. Um, and being able to take some sort of action, uh, even if it's just gathering your documents and um, uh, hiding or hiding some money in a place where you'll be able to get it and get away fast uh, is an antidote to feeling completely powerless. Um, uh, the other part of sort of immediate self-care in the crisis situation is prioritizing being able to establish um, the, the regular rhythms of biological rhythms of one's body. Um, I mean, uh, food and sleep deprivation are very common. Uh, in the crisis period. Um, and of course, uh, when people are captives, food and sleep deprivation are tools of coercive control. Uh, and in the aftermath, people often are so hypervigilant that they can't sleep. They're afraid if they go to sleep, they're going to be attacked or they will have nightmares. Um, uh, they may have day-night reversal where they have to be awake all night and then collapse during the day. Um, and so re-establishing some predictable bodily rhythms is terribly important. One reason that alcoholism and substance abuse is such a common uh, complication of post-traumatic stress disorder is that alcohol and other sedatives, um, uh, opioids, benzodiazepines, and so on, uh, are actually very effective drugs for the hyperarousal of PTSD. Um, but they come at way too high a price. Uh, so uh, there are better drugs for short-term use. Uh, alpha and beta blockers, for example, can be used much more safely. Um, and, uh, and other uh, non-pharmacological sleep aids are often uh, preferable. Um, so it, safety begins with the body and with some agency over, over a plan. 
Um, the 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 second the second strong predictor of good recovery is human connection. Um, the people who suffer the worst after in the aftermath of trauma are people who remain isolated, um, who uh, 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 are afraid to tell or ashamed to tell what happened to them. Uh, and by the way, and, and uh, certainly under circumstances of captivity, such as being a hostage or being uh, a child, an abused child, um, the coercive control techniques that are used um, are designed not only to inst instill terror, but to instill shame. Um, uh, sexual assault is always used as a tool of war precisely because it isolates, it, it fractures the targeted community uh, if the victims are going to be shamed and blamed. Um, and that is even more true, by the way, for male victims um, who are often targeted as well. Uh, I mean, uh, for a woman to acknowledge being victimized doesn't challenge one's femininity, but for a soldier to admit that he's been sexually assaulted is contrary to uh, the, um, you know, the ex expectations of uh, that that a you know a, a, a man cannot be a victim. Um, so, um, in the aftermath of in the in, in, of uh, violence, in in the emergency situation, we always explore who can you talk with, who can you tell, who will be there for you, who will support you, um, and um, and keeping one's and strengthening one's connections with people who, who one trusts is also a powerful antidote to post-traumatic stress. Um, in the, I have a, a close friend and colleague, the psychologist um, Orly Aviona, who grew up in Kibbutz Nachalaz, and um, her sister still lived there till October 7th with her children. Um, and uh, one of the things that has been most helpful since they have been evacuated is that they have stayed together as a group. The, the survivors have been welcomed by a kibbutz in the north and they and and Orly's sister has other options of places she could go, but she wants to be with her community, and her kids want to be with their the, their surviving friends. Um, so, keeping or to, you know reinforcing one's uh, trusted connections. Um, of course, Orly has been on the phone with her sister almost every, I think every day. Um, she's also been on the phone with her Palestinian friends. Um, before Hamas took over in Gaza, Nachalas is like 400 meters from the border. And so the, the people who lived in the kibbutzim had neighbors and, and friends in Gaza. Um, and, and I think it's been incredibly important for Orly and for her friend in Gaza to keep that connection, to, um, 
to reassure one another that they are horrified by the violence committed in their name and that they value their friend, each other's friendships that care about one another. And that, that, is, um, that is the antidote to the helpless rage that victims feel. Um, when you can turn helpless rage into righteous indignation, and when that indignation is shared by others, then one doesn't feel um, that there's nothing in the world but human cruelty. Um, and uh, the third predictor, and, and this is, we see this in a certain percentage of survivors, whether you're, it's been observed in rape survivors, it's been observed in survivors of the Hiroshima atomic bomb, um, is that some people develop what my colleague Robert J. Lifton called the survivor mission. And uh, it's not something one can impose on someone, but if people can make a meaning out of their experience that says, I, I don't know why I survived when so many other people were murdered. But maybe the, maybe the only way I can have a reason for, for my survival is to try to prevent this from happening to anyone else, from ever happening again. And to make my tragedy a gift to others. And that makes people feel empowered because they, as the result of their suffering, they have something to offer other people. And that, and, and so shame and helplessness and uh, are replaced with pride and a sense of agency. Um, and, you, you know, uh, so for example, uh, with many of the people I interviewed for my book, my new book, uh, um, I, I just put out the word that I wanted to talk with survivors of gender violence. And I, I chose gender violence because that's what I know best. And also because according to United Nations, special rapporteurs on, the, on gender violence, which we now have, it is the most widespread human rights violation in the world. Um, uh, but I think it applies to any situation where the dominance of one group over another is maintained ultimately, of course, by violence, but also deeply ingrained in the culture and the tradition, whether that is based on religion, on race, on caste, on class, or on gender. Um, and, the, and many of the people I interviewed said, I'm glad to be able to participate, to, to, to tell my story, because maybe that will help other people, you know? Uh, and uh, so, so those are the things we want to encourage. Uh, safety and self-care, bodily uh, self-care that begins with the body and reaches out to repairing connections and then to a wider community. Um, so why don't I stop there and make sure there's some time for questions. I think you're muted. 
Okay, I just have to find it. Okay, uh, one of the participants asked, I can't stop worrying about the well-being of my family and fight it, find it hard to sleep. What can I do? Ah. That is such a tragic question to have to be asking. Is there one person in the world who you trust? And if so, can you reach out to that person and talk to that person, talk with that person? Because you can't do anything alone. Uh, I mean, you, you can't even uh, take care of yourself alone. Uh, safety is a social construct. Um, so if there's one person in the world who you trust, reach out to that person. If there isn't, reach out to the Blaustein Center. Yeah, the connection, what you said is that the connection is the, to, to other people. This is the the way to cope with the, this arousal and the uh, 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 sleep difficulties. Yeah. Um, oh, ways to cope with sleep difficulties, is that the question? No, no, I just uh, repeat your answer, but uh, oh. uh, the, the, the human connection, yeah? Oh. And, uh, and the sharing and talking, and feel that the presence of uh, people that uh, that you can trust, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and, and and also, I mean, even things like this, the the difficulty sleeping. You know, yeah. with children, we know how to help them sleep. We rock them, we sing to them, we hold them, we stroke them, we give them something, more, you know, to cling to and we need as adults we we need the same things yeah yeah another question um during times of shared trauma where the therapist is also suffering how do we separate self ourself uh we need our own support system um, uh, in order to be witness to our patient's suffering, we get second, even if we're not directly affected, we get secondary traumatic stress. So I, I, my advice to therapists who want to work with trauma is always never do it alone. Um, you need your own um trusted colleagues and uh and friends and people you know because you think you've heard everything and you there's always something someone has done to another human being that you could not imagine in your most it, it, it's it just leaves you speechless so you have to have someone's shoulder to cry on you have to have Someone who you say, you're not going to believe what I just heard, um, who will support you. Yeah. And self-care also for the caregivers. Yes. It's very, very important. The first responders. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for the, uh, all questions, but, uh, uh, we have to go on. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Herman. You have such a unique ability to analyze complex situations 
and reframe them in a clear way so we can understand them and reintegrate them into our minds and our lives. So, so thank you so much for being with us here this evening. And I think I will take it from uh, what you just said, Professor Herman, about having a shoulder to cry on, because two months ago, when the war just began, I was traveling for a month in um, Nicosia, just moving to the beautiful, beautiful mountains of Cyprus, and didn't know what to do, and you, uh, Professor Davidson, and your adorable wife, you called me and you said, just tell us what you need. And of course, obviously you knew and I knew that I can't tell anything. I was crying for, I think an hour and you were just sitting there with me while I was crying and being there. And this, I think by itself, it's so important, but you also said to me, something that I think combines spirituality and psychotherapy and community. And you also said, and morality, you also said, just tell us what you need, we will do it. While knowing that I don't know what I need, but you said also, I'm going to, we're going to come, I'm going to come, we will be there with you either in Cyprus or in Israel, we're going to be there with you. Obviously, I came immediately to Israel the moment I could. I came back to Israel and you came to Israel to be with us. And that was like a huge um, teaching for me that it is not enough, you know, to, to sit and to nod. It is obviously not enough. It is not enough even to understand what I'm saying and to understand the situation, but to be with someone when he or she needs your being there, helping in so many ways, when there is so little to do, but you were with us doing that little that was so much. And I want to say something about the portion of the week before I'll move the microphone to you, Professor Davidson. I want to say that on our weekly portion, we are learning the story about the struggle between Jacob and the angel on the... I'm sorry, Professor, you're on mute. You're on mute. No, just for the last one sentence. Okay, okay, thank you. So I hope I, I, you heard most of my things. I'm just talking about the portion of the week and about Jacob um, being with the, fighting with the angel. And it seems like an inner fight between his willing to finally become an honest person. In Hebrew, Yeshar, Israel, his new name, instead of being like deceiving people like he used to do before. Yaakov is a deceiver. This is the one of, of the meaning of the name Yaakov. And he decided to switch from deceiving people uh, to become an honest people. And it is so, I feel like we're in a huge struggle. I don't think it's with an angel, but in our inner world, we're in a struggle, in a huge struggle to maintain humanity to maintain being honest people and doing the right thing, even and mostly in days that it is so difficult to do the right thing. And I think this is the combination between spirituality and psychology. This is the point where the combination between psychology and spirituality can help us. And you are my teacher for that combination, Professor Davidson. So, we are all very much willing to hear you. You can write questions, the audience, 
people, you can write questions in English, Hebrew, or Arabic, and we will try to at least approach uh, two questions. Uh, thank you very much, Rahama. Um, <clears throat> so um, to begin with, I'm I'm a psychiatrist, but I'm also an internist. My internist, meaning internal medicine, my internal medicine friends think I'm a psychiatrist, and my psychiatry friends uh, think that uh, I'm an internist. So I decided to be a rabbi and confuse everyone, <laughs> um, including myself. Um, so I'm I'm very uh, honored uh, to have you with me, even if by Zoom presence. I'm very moved by um, Gadir Hani's words. Um, I'm also inspired and affirmed by Professor Herman. Um, and what I shall offer from a text, because that's kind of the way I live. I guess as a rabbi in some respects, uh, is in some ways a, an affirmation of, of what Professor Herman said, namely that um, on one foot, uh, in the wake of violent, unspeakable traumas of whatever variety, our recovery at some point is very much dependent upon our having what sometimes in America we call agency, taking action. It's dependent upon our some somehow having some degree of psychological, biological, social homeostasis in the midst of the fray, in the midst of the storm. It's dependent as well upon our remaining connected to one another. And lastly, Sometimes it's further enhanced by our somehow finding meaning, grasping meaning, making meaning out of the whole experience. When Viktor Frankl walked out of Auschwitz, you may remember, he said, Min HaMetzar Karate Ya. He said the Psalms. And from that point forward, he searched and made meaning in his own way. So bearing in mind that uh, um, bag of gratitudes and summaries, um, I shall go forward with um, a different, somewhat different take on things uh, th that I hope you will indulge me with. Consider for a moment um, the words of George Steiner, arguably one of the most wide-ranging yet nuanced Jewish, European, and American literary critics and philosophers of the 20th century, also a survivor of the Shoah. Toward the end of his life, Steiner wrote of his refusal quote, even at the worst hours to abdicate from the belief that the two validating wonders of mortal existence are love and the invention of the future tense. Their conjunction, if it will ever come to pass, is the messianic, unquote. And so we ask in this place of our standing, where is the love? Is there a future? Earlier this week, I was told that over 2,000 individuals had registered for this event. Over 2,000 of you living, working, surviving with family and friends, and trying to cope with the physical, emotional, and spiritual violence of October 7th. The number alone speaks to the grave contagion of continued deep, chaotic pain of body and soul in which you live more than I. 
even before October 7th. Yours was a place of ever-present vigilance, intermittent wars, and existential threat. It has been so for decades. I do not claim to know what it's like to live in such a country or a territory, one that is constantly filled with the threat or reality of deadly assault at home, on the sidewalk, at a bus stop, or even in the open air. What can I, an American Jewish doctor, possibly have to offer you that would be of any use? How do we find love inside a ruin? I'm not sure. But we never are when we first begin efforts at helping others heal, rebuild, and continue to recover from the traumas and ruins of their lives, whether as victims of just or unjust wars, of sadistic or murderous crimes, of family abuse or loss, of undeserved fatal illness or life-threatening accidents, we never are sure if we can help. We can only try. My work as a physician is grounded in a rabbinic education, psychiatric training, and three decades of general adult medicine specialization and practice. My, parent, my, my patients suffer from common problems of heart failure, asthma, diabetes, stomach aches, joint pains, rashes, and headaches. They also come with unexplained itches, fatigue, anxiety, brain fog, and sweats. Many of them struggle with medical symptoms of unclear cause and significance. At least a third of them reveal to us after curious and care and caring attention that in some way, major way, their life has been determined by an extreme trauma far outside the pale of common human experience, whether physical or emotional or both, extreme traumas, sometimes approaching those of October 7th. What to do? or not to do, is always the question. Thousands of dollars are spent and multiple expensive and invasive procedures are generally performed in efforts to find a clear, unambiguous diagnosis and a straightforward treatment. We may be surprised to discover an uncommon presentation of a common diagnosis or much less often, a rare presentation of a rare diagnosis. Most of the time, we're left with a bag of uncertainty, an ongoing suffering from an unknown malady in the context of near calamitous, sometimes forgotten trauma. As physicians, we are left with the fits and starts of roles as healers, trying to navigate shared tears, feelings of hopelessness, and even accusations of professional incompetence. But we try, like you, to do our best with continued caring and curiosity as we engage in listening and responding, we try, like you, to be aware of our personal boundaries and our own triggering emotions so as not to make matters worse. Like you, we offer formulations or coherent personal narratives of what has happened and where we are now as starting points for going forward. Like you, we suggest the merits of lifestyle changes 
to be claimed gradually and consistently. Graded exercise, spiritual practice, hypnosis, sleep enhancement, and supportive psychotherapies, all the things that in some ways were alluded to earlier by Professor Herman. As physicians, we may offer as well the merits of medications when they can be targeted to specific symptoms. Thankfully, these various recipes and algorithms are helpful to some extent with most of the patients in our clinic, but they're seldom enough. You would likely assume this to be the case for my practice at Mayo. You know this to be the case for yours in the land of October 7th. And yet in the past almost eight weeks, you have taught me. You have shown me some of the more which is needed beyond the recipes and the algorithms. Maybe you don't even realize it. Almost a year ago, in the first week of January 2023, articles appeared in both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal related to a newly released book of Dr. Keltner, a neuropsychologist at UC Berkeley. The book was entitled Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. The book was ordered on my desk and read within the month. In brief, it posits that the experience of awe in our lives as utter amazement in the face of an event or encounter which transcends all understanding is the ingredient which most ensures our survival, both individually and collectively. The book claims a definition of the term, what I just said, establishes its causes and their relative frequencies, and even offers data as to its impact on immune function and societal cooperation. What does any of this have to do with you, me, and October 7th? Two weeks ago today, I was in the Jerusalem YMCA after a week spent there in Bethlehem and in Ramallah. The week included much walking and talking with Professor Weiss. It also included sitting in a circle of protesters and supporters of hostage families behind the Knesset as they discussed and listened to each other while offering comfort and challenge. It included meeting a middle-aged woman across the street, standing in vigil with family and friends in the wake of a yet to be acted upon court decision in her favor related to a crime of sexual abuse by a rabbi. It included Palestinian and American friends living in Bethlehem where they're trying to ensure that food and medicines are available for those in need. It included two visits with a longtime friend and Palestinian businessman in Ramallah who has a degree from Tel Aviv University and continues to engage Israelis, Americans, and all comers in spite of being denied entry into Israel and denied full voice by the Palestinian Authority. It included a renewed contact with a Jerusalem Muslim driver and friend of over a decade who has worked for Seeds of Peace and wants nothing to do with Hamas or Palestinian misgovernance. 
It included sitting in the Jerusalem fabric shop in the Christian quarter of another longtime Muslim friend and multi-generational Jerusalemite. There were no tourists or customers, but two Jewish tour guides stopped by to offer him encouragement and financial support. And lastly, it included standing on the deck of the YMCA swimming pool, talking with a coach, Emmanuel Mann, a 70-year-old kibbutznik who is determined to continue coaching his team of Jewish, Muslim, and Christian teenagers in spite of October 7th and everything else. His priorities, their education, their friendships, and then their swimming strokes. If all of these individuals, both Israeli and Palestinian, both young and old, inside and outside the green line, do not inspire awe, then what possibly can? In his book, Keltner has suggested that on the basis of surveying a worldwide multicultural cohort of individuals, that the most frequent inspirations of awe are what he terms moral beauty and collective effervescence. He suggests that moral beauty is the doing of the right thing, even without clear benefit to one's self-interest. Collective effervescence is a heightened sense of connection with other people through a shared activity or experience as exemplified in the work of NGOs, political protests, and social support networks. It sounds very much like my friends above and like all of you. And so we return and ask again of George Steiner and of ourselves, where is the love? And is there a future tense in the wake of October 7th? We have our trauma drugs, algorithms, and psychotherapies but we also have, especially my friends above and you, begun changing the script of God's bad dream climaxed on October 7th. It is changing with the human embodiment and enactment of awe in individual deeds of moral beauty among us all and of collective effervescence in the uplift of swim teams, aid groups, NGOs, and protest movements. We may not be closer to the messianic as the bombings, rockets, combat, and terrorist acts continue. But at least we're not in full speed retreat. At least we're still laboring for love inside our ruins. Can you heal our song? Amen. Amen. Professor Davidson, it was like poetry, and you know, hearing you, it is just hearing you. It, relaxes me and I feel less in pain than I was before um, the combination of literature and poetry and psychology is so powerful and Yael Schweid asked for the name of the George Steiner book if you can write it down on chat and then I have uh, another question the, the name the name is Errata E R R A T A. It's a it's a something of a intellectual biography. It's it's pure George Steiner. 
it, it's it's kind of an autobiography of sorts. It's a short book, Yale Press. What I just quoted is actually toward the. It's in the on the last page, but don't but don't just don't just go to the last page. <laughs> And the question is more practical and very important because practical issues is what we are worried about. Uh, I'm very worried about the prevalence of trauma in the whole white Israeli society and its effects on our society for many more years. Do you have suggestions for a large scale way of dealing with this phenomena? of us being a traumatic society for many, many more years. What can we do as a community? Wow. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that there's any, I don't know that there's any substitute for, well, there's not. For for dialogue, for uh, talking with one another, for uh, uh, um, avoiding social isolation, for meeting the stranger, for not as for I, I mean, I, as someone who lives in America, I think it's fair to say that many of us, particularly Jewish, and and for those who are not Jewish, who pay attention. I mean, we've really stood. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bludgeoning the word, but I mean, we we've, we've really stood in awe at the degree to which Israelis have come together as, um, as a, as groups, as people trying to make sense of 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 things and of doing it together. And even, for example, in the in the wake of the judicial review. Uh, protest movements, the fact that um, groups who had in some ways been opposed to one another after October 7th somehow found common ground to come together again. Uh, so the fact that um, dialogue in that respect did occur between people who were to some extent adversaries, that's a, that's, that's a hope. But I I th I think the you know the key is what what uh, Professor Herman had said as, as well. I mean, I mean, first of all, we we can't just sit around and worry about it and and throw our hands up. We can, but we try not to. And you your Israeli society is unlike anything I've ever seen in my seventy years on the planet on planet Earth. And the way that things were mobilized, both pre. October seven and and afterwards, we we people are doing things that's important. We that can't stop. Uh, there has to be an effort at homeostasis at at a society at, at the society's maintaining its art, its literature, its multi dimensional biopsychosocial life, the environment. That's what we mean by homeostasis. We try to keep doing that as opposed to being between extremities. Um, I also already mentioned the, um, and as did Professor Herman, the importance of avoiding isolation. I mean, the people in the United States, for example, who seem to be the recurrent murderers and shooters in a mass way, are often isolated, angry, alone, frightened young men. Uh, as was just the, the case with the three student Palestinian students who attended the Friends School, which my wife and I have been quite familiar and visited many times in Ramallah. Those three students were shot in Vermont, as you all know, uh, over the weekend by, once again, an isolated, angry, uh, apparently, uh, lost young man. Isolation is not a good thing. And then I guess the other part of the of the avoiding the violence is again, I, I'll just dovetail on what uh, Dr. Professor Herman said is uh, we have to somehow 
seek a meaning, make a meaning, find a hope, do something actively to love each other in this ruin. Um, and I mean, we basically have it have have a choice between two things. We can either see life as absurd, or we can see life as somehow being a revelation. We can either say, I mean, I mean that that's 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 overstating it. But you know, we can even but we can be an existentialist like Camus and all the rest and say it's absurd, but then we can also like Camus and all the rest say, so it's our task to go out and make our meaning to claim a meaning of for life outside the violence. That's a long-winded answer, um, but that's that's the best I have at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be, thank you so much for being with us and trying to answer questions that are in many ways can't be answered. And I feel that love is always the answer and love is not always particularly someone that you love, but the ability to love, to find love in yourself and to believe that love still exists. And I thank you so much for that. And I think we can all pray and meditate and practice love. And now it's a great, time to practice love this is what we can do so thank you for being with us and helping us practicing community and love and a few ending words so again thank you so much Gadir and uh, Professor Herman and Professor Davidson I heard uh, your uh, voice um, Professor Davidson, in uh, the beginning of your talk, may I am your voice re? And I think that this is a wide question uh, that uh, we are ho all, all of us here um, asked and asked in the meaning of question and asked in the meaning of needs. And um, uh, Professor Herman, in your book, uh, Truth and Repair, you write that recovery from trauma demands a deep process of grief that should take place within the community. You explain that these processes should take place within the community it's because it's impossible to grieve and to give meaning to the events and the experience alone. You write that when these processes occur within the community, the trauma becomes an opportunity to deepen the connection with the wide, wider community, creating a sense that life is possible. New possibilities are created. This evening is a good example of the process of recovery and repair the gathering of so many people to learn, to listen, and to acquire knowledge, hope, and believe in new possibilities in life. In the middle of a terrible attack on our security, our basic values, our children, our homes, and our very existence is part of this process. And a big thank you to you, the audience. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Professor Ohana Weiss, for creating this evening and this place for all of us. I pray that this war will soon be over and that before long, all the hostages will return safely and that we will be able to concentrate our efforts on recovery, repair, and growth. Thank you very much. And good evening with good news. Thank you.